This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision making for Canadians. We are hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore. So this is week 65, and something special happened for this week's uh, episode. Yeah, we had uh, one of our listeners reached out to me on Twitter, and he pitched pitched an, ep- an episode idea and said that he's been listening to the podcast, and he comes from a medical background. He's an oral maxillofacial surgery resident at McGill. Lots of experience with evidence in, in the medical world. And he wanted to come on to talk about his experience as a, as a DIY investor and, and, and getting his head into investing through the podcast, among other resources. But he also wanted to draw some analogs between the, the way that the medical field uses evidence and the way that the field of investing uses evidence, which are, I think, as we all know, extremely different. So his name is Dr. Wendell Mascarenas. Really insightful interview. He put a lot of thought and preparation into the points he wanted to contribute back to this community and he very much views it as a community. He was quite grateful and gracious in talking about the impact this has had on him. But he did do a, he did a great job outlining the impact of evidence and how they think about different levels of evidence in the medical world. Yeah, and he had the, the pyramid, which we'll post in the show notes on the rationalreminder.ca site, the, the lowest level of evidence. So this is how the medical community thinks about evidence. The lowest level of evidence is expert opinion which as we <laughs> which is our world as we all know the our world of investment management that's the whole world expert opinion and uh, the, the highest level of uh, evidence I, I think i don't have the pyramid in front of me right now but it's it's meta studies of peer-reviewed studies and that's like in a, in a recent episode in episode 60 we talked about the fama and french paper that they came out with in 2006 that really solidified the the theoretical background of the their five factor model and that was a meta study that was they, they took all of a bunch of peer reviewed research showing certain things to be apparently true and they wrapped all that up into a theoretical explanation which they then created more empirical data with anyway it was wendell thanks for joining us very much we appreciate it and have a listen Welcome to episode 65 of the Rational Reminder podcast. Today we have a unique guest. When we first started the podcast, we had a few, well, I guess I'll back up. Lately, we've had a lot of sort of expert financial guests. When we started the podcast, we had quite a few people on who were experts in their own field and maybe they had careers in, in finance, but there are people that we, that we knew. I had someone reach out to me recently on Twitter, not, not someone that I knew, but they had a, basically a pitch for an episode idea. I thought it was pretty cool. So Wendell, welcome to the podcast. And if you can just tell us and our listeners a little bit about why you reached out, that'd be that'd be great. Yeah. So thanks a lot for having me. So for me, coming from a non-financial background, one of the main reasons I listened to the podcast, like many other listeners, was to learn more about the industry and different questions, have them answered. And what I realized after listening to, you know, many, many episodes was that we hadn't had kind of a voice of the listener on the podcast yet, someone that was going through this and someone that was maybe new to do-it-yourself investing to begin with. So I reached out hoping that I could give kind of a listener perspective and things we go through as a new investor, but also because I realized that a lot of times data is quoted on this podcast or evidence is brought up on this podcast. And I really thought comparing how evidence is used in your industry compared to my industry, which is healthcare, was really kind of a stark contrast and an interesting topic to discuss. And can you just talk a little bit about yourself and, and what, what you do and wh- why you have this, not unique, but you have this different perspective on, on evidence that, uh, that the financial services industry has? For sure. So myself, I did my undergraduate in sciences and biology, and then I went and completed dental school. After that, I actually went to medical school and completed that as well. And I'm currently in my last year of a surgical residency program in Montreal at McGill. So for me, I've kind of grown up in a healthcare oriented family and uh, all my education has been in kind of healthcare. And we look at evidence very different from how people in the financial industry or even new investors look at evidence. So I think kind of the unique perspective I bring is how are we using evidence to make healthcare decisions? And what are the levels of evidence that we value and we look for when I'm going to change my mind about making a certain prescription difference or, or a surgery difference or really a healthcare decision. Interesting. So first of all, shout out to my fellow McGill grad. So let's go back. So that's a fascinating setup. So how did you get in interested in investing? 
So I was introduced uh, to investing at a young age to the Canadian couch potato, actually, by my father. So at the time, I was quite young. I didn't really grasp the importance of investing or savings or or keeping co- like any of the stuff that you guys talk about on a on a daily uh, on a weekly basis. I didn't really grasp any of that. And it wasn't until the past few years where I actually got married. And now I'm kind of in charge of my, managing the investments and the finances. And all of a sudden, there were all these decisions to make, and I had to track these things. And that's when I became a lot more interested. So the funny thing is, the first material I was ever given by my dad was the print money sense issue of the Canadian Couch Potato Strategy by Dan Bordelotti in 2011. And I actually still have that book. And last year, I went and read it again after knowing a lot more now than I did then. And it's amazing how everything still applies eight years later. The only difference being the uh, amount of ETFs we have in Canada and the array of different choices we have. I think it's important for the listeners to know that I have no financial background whatsoever, and neither does my dad. He's a family physician. Uh, we're both in healthcare. We've never taken like financial courses, seminars. I'm not saying you have to, but I'm just trying to emphasize that all of my knowledge, me particularly, has come from what my dad taught me, from Ben's YouTube channel, the Canadian Couch Potato website and podcast. I actually watched all of Susan Daly's uh, YouTube videos as well, and of course, this podcast. So you could say I'm kind of all in on the PWL educational products. So you just mentioned all those resources, which obviously help push the idea of index funds, but maybe from the perspective of the evidence and how you make decisions in, in general, how, how did you make the decision to proceed with the, the strategy of, of using index funds for your investments? So for me, you know, growing up with my dad now doing index ETFs, he kind of taught me about it. So that was the first exposure I had. But when he started Vanguard, wasn't even in Canada. He had to go through a lot of different challenges to get to that level. So he's the first one that's going to tell you he made every mistake in the book, whether it was picking stocks or dealing with a, an active manager with high cost uh, mutual funds, investing in financial products with a promise of huge gains. He did all these different things until he finally discovered index ETFs. And the way he discovered it was kind of funny. He actually saw a book by Jack Bogle. And after reading that, he said, wait, what's going on with this index fund? You can buy the whole market. It's lower cost. But at the time, it was really complicated because you had to go through the U.S. to get Vanguard funds. And it it was really difficult. But that's kind of what he did. And it wasn't an overnight phenomenon. He suffered with poor investment strategies and decisions for decades before finally learning about it. So then for me, when I was uh, approached with this knowledge and kind of when I look at the industry right now, someone's coming to you and they're saying you can buy a single ETF or perhaps a few if you'd like to split it up and you can own the whole market. You can have an expected long-term positive return. You can beat 85% of active managers every year while paying lower fees and doing absolutely nothing except maybe rebalancing once a year. So for me, it's truly mind-blowing that so much money is still in active management when you present it that way. Yeah, no kidding. So can you talk about the role that evidence plays, you know, for you and your dad, not only in your daily work, but just in how you operate and think in general? So in medicine and dentistry, which is my background, we use evidence on a daily basis to make our decisions. So a lot of the times our decisions are based on what's in the literature and what's the most up-to-date material that we have. That means if you come to us with a common problem, and there's a lot of data or research on that, we'll look up the literature and we'll say, okay, you have an infection, this antibiotic is known to fight that infection, so we'll prescribe that antibiotic. Now, sometimes they'll come to us with a very unique problem or unique condition, and maybe there isn't a lot of data there. Then that's when you know expert opinion or case reports or other resources are more useful to us to say, we'll try this treatment out and you'll have to come back to us. I think the important thing to realize is why evidence is so important for us in our daily lives is that we're held to a standard of care, meaning if someone were to sue us, the court will look, did you follow the standard of care? Are you prescribing and practicing the most up-to-date medicine and dentistry based on current practices? So if I'm not keeping up to date with the literature and the evidence changes and my treatment isn't the standard of care, I can be held liable for that. Right. So different from financial services where number one, no one's looking at the evidence. And then as evidence, new evidence does emerge, no one's making decisions based on that. So that, yeah, that's, that's very, 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 very different. Now, when new evidence emerges, so you, you just mentioned the, the standard of, of care, when new evidence emerges, how, how does that get incorporated into the decisions that you're making? So I think actually, Ben, you mentioned a previous episode that the stronger the evidence that you have for a certain practice or belief or strategy, whether it's investing healthcare, the stronger the evidence you have, 
the stronger the new evidence needs to be to overturn that decision-making process. So the exact same thing applies to healthcare. So for certain things that are common or understood really well, we have standard guidelines, similar to how you guys kind of publish white papers to say, this is a heavily investigated topic. Here's kind of our overall recommendation. We have that in medicine and dentistry for very, very common things. When new evidence comes, it needs to be very profound. It needs to be documented and carried out in a evidence-based manner to really convince the general public that this is something we should change. I think one of my professors said it best where if you attend a conference or a lecture and someone presents something to you and they don't quote a single piece of literature or data, you should probably just ignore everything they just told you. Interesting, because that's what everybody's, well, everybody, in most cases, when you're talking to someone in our field, they're not going to be quoting or, or citing any literature. What do you think the main reason is for that? Is it because in, in your world, it's it's a life or death situation? Ours is much more subjective? Well, I think one of the, the issues is people seem to think about the healthcare industry that we're making decisions based on our expertise and our experience, which is definitely true. But a lot of the times our expertise and our experience comes from the literature that we've reviewed and the evidence we have. In our classes, when they're teaching us things, like for example, when they're teaching me how to do surgery, all our approaches, everything we do, everything we prescribe is based on evidence and trials and the literature. It's not based on, oh, what does this particular surgeon think the best way to remove an appendix is? It's no. Look, they did this trial, multi-center trial throughout the US. They had thousands of patients. They tried doing one way, they tried doing another way, and they found, hey, in this second group, Patients had less pain, they went home faster, and they had a greater quality of life afterwards. This is how we're making our decisions in healthcare. Whereas I think when people view investing, even myself, I I didn't realize there was so much data that you could access in the first place. And I didn't realize that there was a lot of good data that proved certain trends over long periods of time. So you you kind of alluded to it a minute ago, but you sent me a a pyramid uh, when you pitched this episode to me, and it, it was the different levels of evidence. And you mentioned that the evidence that we generally talk about on our, on our podcast is the highest level of evidence. But can you, can you describe the different levels of evidence? Yeah. So uh, it's great that you're going to post in the show notes, I think, this pyramid, because I think it would help the listener kind of visualize it. But I want everyone to think of a pyramid where each level of the pyramid is a level of evidence, where the top of the pyramid is the highest level of evidence, which means it's the highest level of quality and has the least amount of bias. Whereas at the bottom of the pyramid... We have evidence that is the lowest quality and has the highest amount of bias. Now, the very, very top of the pyramid is is called a systematic review or meta-analysis, which just means you're gathering all the high-quality data and analyzing it. But I want to go one rung below that. That's uh, the highest level of evidence you can have for a single trial or a single paper, which is a randomized controlled trial. So I'll use an analogy to try and explain it. Let's say a pharmaceutical company wanted to market a new drug for anxiety. And it's supposed to really help reduce anxiety. Well, in order to prove this, they would set up a double-blinded, randomized controlled trial. And what that would do is they would randomly allocate patients with anxiety into three groups. In the first group, they'd have patients taking the new drug. In the second group, they'd have patients taking maybe the current best drug on the market. And in the third group, they'd have patients taking a placebo. So that's why it's random. They're randomly assigned to each group. Now, when we get to double-blinded, it's important the patient doesn't know which drug they're taking. And the physician evaluating them doesn't know which drug they're taking. Because you can see there's biases here. If you're a patient and you know you're in the placebo group, you're probably going to report higher levels of anxiety because you you know you're not getting any medication for it. And if I'm a physician and I'm evaluating a patient that I know to be in the new drug and I'm hired by the pharmaceutical company, I might have a bias to report decreased levels of anxiety. So this is a very high level of evidence because it's trying to remove as much bias as possible and show the results. Now, the reason the control group is important is you always need to compare to something. So let's say the new drug reduces your anxiety by 20%. Sounds pretty great. But what if that control group of the placebo people reduced your anxiety by 15% and they weren't even taking a real medication? Or the current gold standard reduced it by 30%. All of a sudden, just by having some comparators, it doesn't sound so great anymore. So to parallel this to investing, let's say someone tells you, look, follow my strategy Over the past 10 years, I've received 9% annualized returns. Sounds pretty great. But did they compare it to the benchmark index, for example? What if that had 10% annualized returns and a lower cost? So all of a sudden, by comparing things, 
you get higher levels of quality data and comparison. I think it's impossible in investing to have levels of evidence that are identical because there's all these other factors that are involved, but it's just something you can strive to, something that's kind of an ideal thing that you can look forward to. So interesting. I have so many questions. One I've got for you is about MD management. So we often hear that doctors make uh, bad investors. I don't necessarily agree. We have many terrific clients who are doctors, but I've always wondered about MD management, which largely sells active products. I know they do have some index in their lineup, index funds, but they largely sell active management to physicians. I've often wondered why would you promote such a belief system to a group of people that make decisions based on evidence? It's almost like they're ignoring the evidence and what they're providing you. You can even take it one step further. And why is MD promoting that? Sure, that, that's an interesting question. But why are why are physicians investing with them? That's the, I mean, MD can sell whatever they want, but when physicians are making decisions based on evidence, why would they invest in the actively managed funds? Yeah, so from my early experience in talking to others, uh, unfortunately, I would agree that the majority of physicians do fall in the category of poor investors. I believe the problem would be in three kind of areas. The first area is just ignorance of the evidence. As I said, even myself, before I kind of learned from you guys and other educational channels that you guys promote, I didn't realize there was such an abundance of evidence when it came to investing. Like the idea of having papers published and these landmark papers and five-factor model and all these different things you guys talk about, I had no idea that existed. And I think a lot of physicians would be the same. But you guys are evidence-based decision makers. What does this say about the average person in public, right? Exactly. If you, if you don't so, have that framework, who would? Exactly. If, if, if we can't even think of it that way, yeah, would the average investor think of that? I totally agree. So then the second area I think would be is in healthcare, you have to understand, I've gone through over a decade of, of school and classes and education and everything's in a hierarchy where each year you get better and you get more trained and more comfortable, you learn more, you're given more responsibility. And we really respect people that are above us in education and have been working for a long time. And we know that it takes a long time to be comfortable. So for us, our whole kind of profession is based on an implicit trust. When, when you as a patient come to me and I ask you what's going on and you tell me, I have an implicit trust that I believe your symptoms, I believe what you're telling me. And you have a trust that I'm listening to you and I'm going to give you the best advice possible based on what I know. So for us, I believe as physicians, when we go to a financial advisor at the bank, which should be the place where the expert is, and they tell us you have a lot of money, we need to protect it. We need to be conservative. We need to let it grow. We need to diversify. We need to do these things. And I have these products that I use that have a long track record of success and can really help you grow for retirement for your kids. We're going to believe that. We're naturally, our natural instinct is to believe the experts. So I think when you mentioned MD management, I think a physician is highly likely to believe someone that's been an advisor for 20 years or has a lot of seniority or is part of a large group such as MD management that gives them a lot of clout. Do you think like based on your experience coming up as a, as a new physician, what were the prior to finding the podcast and, and the other things that you mentioned, wh- where would you have been getting your information from? So this this is the shocking thing is if, if I hadn't discovered all this or if my dad hadn't taught me these things, the only way we have to discover things is people come to our uh, lectures as when you're in dental school or you're in medical school, you have these groups come to you to talk to you about financial planning and investing, but they're almost always from the bank and they're almost always promoting an active strategy. They actually come to you when you're in school because they realize you don't really have a lot of money now. In fact, all we have is debt, but they see the potential once you graduate and they want to kind of get to you early and really talk to you when you're naive and young and they can kind of lock you in and go forward with you. So that that would be the only exposure I would have had would be these people coming as guest lecturers to our school. So from that, you've chosen the path of uh, to be a do-it-yourself type investor, which we've always said is great. If someone can do it, absolutely they should. They can save on the, on the expenses. Uh, now that you've done it for a while, what do you think are the keys to being a successful DIY investor? So yeah, so preparing for this, I was trying to think, you know, I figured you'd ask me about being a young do-it-yourself investor. What are some tips that I can give to the listener? Because it's easy to always talk about what the issues are, but you have to give solutions that people are going to be able to change. So I've tried to divide into kind of five tips that I would give someone that's new. So the first one is embrace simplicity. I remember in high school, and keep in mind, I'm only 30 years old, so high school wasn't that long ago, but you would go to a party and at the end of the night, you'd have to get a cab home. You'd have to call the cab company, 
to wait on the line for an hour. You would hope that they would show up. And even when they showed up, someone else could take it. You'd have to coordinate cash, multiple stops, splitting with your friends. It, it was a nightmare at the end of the night. And nowadays we have something called Uber. You go on your phone, you click a button, and everything is done for you in a matter of seconds. We embrace simplicity in all aspects of our lives. But for some reason, when it comes to investing, we feel the need to complicate things. And if it's not complex, it means we're doing something wrong. So the first advice I would give would be embrace simplicity, even if that just means buying something like VBAL or XBAL on every single account with all of your funds. If you do that, you're, you're at a great start. My second tip would be ignorance is bliss. One of the toughest parts, I think, about becoming a do-it-yourself investor that no one talks about is there's actually a rapid transition in the acquisition of knowledge. At first, when you want to become a do-it-yourself investor, you have to learn about index mutual funds, index ETFs, uh, taxable accounts, MERs, asset allocation, all these different topics you have to learn about. But I would argue as soon as you learn about all of that, it's actually beneficial to then turn off your brain and stop learning more. Because the more you learn after that, and the more you tune into the news or read articles or newspapers, is the more likely you're going to get sidetracked from kind of what your vision is and what you're trying to do. I remember on your podcast, you guys talked about how I think in December of last year, there was a market correction. I think you, maybe you mentioned 20%. And a lot of people, even index investors, panicked and they sold. But by mid-January, it had recovered. And I think you mentioned the past six months have been like really great for returns. And you guys being in the industry, you would know all this. But I think my greatest accomplishment is not that I didn't panic, not that I didn't sell. It's that I had no idea any of this was going on. If, if you don't tune in, if you don't follow this, it's not a hard decision because I actually only found out that this happened in the market because you guys said on your podcast, I had no idea. <laughs> it's funny. So I think ignorance is bliss. Number three is don't have a play money account. I'm a strong believer that if you have a play money account, Whatever is going to happen, it's a lose-lose. Either you make money and you think you're good and you're going to do it, keep doing it, or you lose all your money and then you lost money. Number four, become a do-it-yourself investor gradually. Often people try and go from active management to do-it-yourself investment in one fell swoop. And it's really intimidating. It's really difficult. And if you think about it, you wouldn't go from sitting on your couch to running a marathon in a day. It takes time. So I like to think of it as a spectrum where you have active, high-cost mutual funds on one side and do-it-yourself on the other side in, in the purest sense. But then you have financial advisors, you have robo-advisors. You don't need to do it all in one step. You should take your time. I think it's not something you should rush into. Finally, the tip number five is talk to someone before making big decisions. I think a good habit is never to make impulse decisions. It used to be where if you had a question about investing, you could only talk to your family, your friends, or your financial advisor, and maybe they wouldn't have the same goals or the same mindset as you. But now with things like this podcast, with Common Sense Investing on YouTube, I think if you just have a question, you should just go on the channel and ask it. And either one of you two will answer or another listener will answer. And they'll just give you a link to a video or an article and instantly your question will be answered. And maybe you'll realize, hey, maybe I don't need to spread my investments over the entire year for dollar cost averaging. Maybe the statistics show it's better just to put it all in as a lump sum. You know, one of the most amazing things that I've found about the mostly the YouTube channel, because that's where there are so many comments a lot of the time someone will ask a really good question and I won't even answer it, but somebody else on the channel will give, like you said, a great answer or they'll post a link. And it's like, that's, that's pretty cool that there are people who have their heads in this stuff enough that I don't even have to answer questions a lot of the time. Exactly. And I think that the YouTube channel is at a good size right now where it's, it's got great viewership, but also it's got a kind of a community where people are helping each other. And I think it's really important as do-it-yourself investors or people in your industry that we're supportive of each other. We can't judge each other because all of us, were ignorant to this at one point. And you can't blame, so I would never have known about any of this if I hadn't discovered these educational products myself. So we talked about, or you talked about simplicity, and I agree, simplicity is super important. And as much as I love Vigro, and I do, I think it's great for a lot of people, we've obviously published our Rational Reminder Model ETF portfolios, which include IJS and IUSV to get some small cap and value and a little bit of profitability exposure. What do you think about what, what do you think about getting getting factor exposure as a do-it-yourself investor? And are, are you are you doing that? So this is one of the things that was kind of mentioned in my part of how I feel like you kind of need to transition your knowledge at one point. I did find when I started listening to your podcast, I had never heard of factors before. And I found you guys were educating us. I mean, at first you were kind of just talking about factors all the time. And I think you guys got some feedback that, hey, people might not know what factors are except for your clients. So then I know that you guys did a couple of episodes where you actually finally explained, we're still waiting on the 
Ben explains to his mom what factors are episode. But you guys had a, a previous episode, probably like 30 episodes, where you really went down and explained exactly what they were. And this is one of those examples where I felt like it actually kind of hurt me in the sense that I started going crazy about factors in my mind because I'm currently not doing any of that. And I started thinking I'm lagging behind. I'm only 30 when I'm 60 and I look back and regret, wow, I never did factors. I never did small cap. I never did value. And I was kind of, you know, going into the weeds with this. And I was actually talking with my, one of my friends about it, who's also a new do-it-yourself investor. And it helped to talk to him because he said, listen, they've proven to you with this data that these are good things. They've shown to you what you would have to do to capture those, those factors, those premium benefits. Are you willing to do those things? And it took me, I'm not going to lie, it took me a long time, but eventually I decided I value the simplicity of just buying one thing with all of my investments once a year and not thinking about it versus multiple ETFs to try and capture those factors. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Along a similar line of discussion, just the, the complexity versus simplicity how do you think, so you're, you're a do-it-yourself investor, which is great. And there's a whole community of do-it-yourself investors around the content that we produce, but we also have a lot of clients who pay for financial advice. And you also mentioned earlier, or it might've been in your original message that you see a lot of people around you who are not doing a good job or even any job as do-it-yourself investors. So how do you think about it? And how do you think that your peers think about the role of financial advice? So I think it's really important for people to realize that financial advice is not an evil product that you need to avoid at all costs once you become a do-it-yourself investor. I think financial advice is a really useful service that you should use when you need it and not use when you don't need it. I like to make the analogy of going to the gym. All of us can buy a gym membership and say, I, I know what I need to do to stay in shape. I need to go three to four times a week. I need to work hard while I'm there. And I need to do a variety of cardio, weightlifting. I can print out routines online. Everything's available on the internet, YouTube videos. But the reality is, are you going to be disciplined enough to go to the gym three to four times a week, work as hard as you can, and do it on a consistent basis over the long run? Yes, hiring a personal trainer is really expensive. But if it forces you to go there, if it forces you to work hard, if it helps you achieve your goals, does it really matter that it was more expensive? People need to realize that the goal of investing is to meet your goals. So if you need financial advice or if you have questions, I think it's a great service to use. And I think people that are new, as I said, you should do this gradually. I think if you sign up with a financial advisor and you do it on a short-term basis for five years, for example, and it helps get your finances order, helps you understand the market, helps you understand behavioral aspects of finance, and then you transition to doing yourself later on, that's, there's no problem with that. I think that financial advice is really useful helping bridge that gap of uncertainty. Absolutely interesting. So our industry is quite famous for putting together all kinds of studies that show the value of great advice and behavior modification and you know the so-called behavior gap, which is the average investor greatly lags even the performance of index funds. Therefore, when you have an advisor, you adhere to your plan better and have higher expected returns compared to your peers. I'm curious, in your DIY world, what do you do or have you done anything specifically to ensure good behavior and adherence to your plan? So I haven't done anything as of yet because, first of all, I'm young in my career. One of the things I've learned from you guys is that when you talk about 10 years, that's a short period of time. That's not a long period of time. And I think that's a new concept to a lot of people. If someone says, oh, I've been doing this for 10 years and it's work, you're like, oh, great. That's only 10 years. That doesn't mean anything. So for me, what I've set up is every year I have a date in the summer, July 1st, and that's kind of my rebalancing date. And I just go on July 1st. As I said, I don't check what the market is. I, don't, I have no idea what's going on in the world when it comes to finance or the market, stock market or bonds or GICs. I go on July 1st and I used to have to just rebalance on that day. But now that I've switched to the, the asset allocation ETFs, now I just go, I look at what I've saved in them and I'm putting towards that. And I just make a one-time purchase through a discount brokerage. So I know kind of what you're mentioning as far as people that, you know, they say pay yourself first by putting savings aside or doing regular contributions. Because I'm doing an index ETF, it's better to just do one lump sum investing versus frequent purchasing and incurring like a trading cost. But for me, it's just July 1st. Every summer, that's just the date I do everything. But you, if you have the cash available, you'd want a dollar cost average, especially with free ETF buys, right? Yeah. If it didn't cost anything, I would do it maybe once a month, like for, for uh, I would do it more frequently. Aren't there uh, like Quest, Quest Trade has free ETF buys, right? Yeah, they do. I'm currently with uh, the discount brokerage of my bank just to keep it simpler. And there's okay. a dollar fee. Okay. Interesting. 
Got it. Okay. So you talked a little bit about, well, we talked a lot about evidence. I mean, we've talked about how people in Canada specifically aren't really embracing the evidence. So there, there is this massive body of evidence, which you're now familiar with, which suggests that there is an intelligent way that most people should be investing. If there were something that's sweeping in the medical community, how would that information be disseminated across the community? So the way we usually get most of our evidence is journals and conferences. So in medicine and dentistry, there's what's called a continuing education requirement. In order to maintain your license with the licensing body, you have to do a certain amount of credits or gain a certain amount of credits in continuing education per year, which means that if you're not attending conferences or doing journal clubs or study clubs, you could actually lose your license. So for me, one of the easiest ways, if you attend a, a review conference or the national meeting conference, for example, in Canada, they have experts in each kind of subspecialty that present new evidence, present their approach. And as I said, some people present a lot of evidence, some people don't. So you, you still have to take everything with a grain of salt, but that's usually the number one way it's disseminated. And obviously, we have some very reputable journals. In medicine, there's, there's very high impact factor journals, there's low impact factor journals. So if you subscribe to those journals, you're able to look at the, the most cutting edge research and, and all the updates coming out through that. If it's something major like groundbreaking, it's something that the National Association, for example, the Canadian Medical Association, the Canadian Dental Association, they'll publish on their website, you know, a, a white paper or a new guideline, a new edition of the guidelines, things like that. That will be published on, on a major kind of uh, national scale. So it's just so different from our, from our industry where we have continuing education requirements too, but you can get through a cycle of continuing education probably without seeing a single academic paper cited. Do you agree, Cameron? Oh, 100%. Like you can even go through a cycle of, of continuing education where you might be learning about how to predict the market, like how to, how to time the market. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the, the other funny thing is, you know, when we talked about a pyramid, I, I like to focus on the top of the pyramid just to give everyone kind of a, an idea of what's at the top. I think it's important just to briefly mention what's at the bottom of the pyramid. So the lowest quality of evidence we have in medicine and the highest risk of bias is what's called editorials or expert opinion. So just think about that for a second. If you're reading the newspaper or you're watching TV or your best friend is telling you at a party what's going on and they're giving their expert opinion, that is without any data, without any research, that is the lowest level of evidence available. And I think when it comes to investing, a lot of people have that opinion where a lot of it is based on expert opinion or what they see on TV. And that is considered the lowest level of evidence as far as I'm concerned and as far as the medical community is concerned. That's, that's incredible. As we've been talking about through this discussion, that's probably how most people are getting consuming their investment advice is through expert opinion. And most questions we've had recently are based on the inverted yield curve and the fear of recession, which is in all the newspapers. It's crazy. You know, we talked about this, Cameron and I talked about this on a, on a, on a recent podcast episode, but one of the things that I found amazing about when, when people are talking about the, the YouTube channel that we've created, one of the reasons people are saying that they like it is because it's we're, we're actually citing literature and there's a ton of investing content on YouTube, but it's all expert opinion. Yeah. And I was, I was going to say, I can already hear maybe some listeners screaming at their headsets. Wait, but this guy is saying expert opinion is useless. And why does he support the podcast? Why does he support these YouTube channels? Like, isn't there kind of a hypocrisy there? But I think it's important to distinguish between expert opinion and like a statement of facts or educational instruction for regular viewers or regular listeners of the podcast, but also regular viewers of your channel, common sense investing you're not giving your opinion based on what you think or what you want people to do. It's, hey, this is a question. Let's look at the data. And this is what the data says. You're more instructing people as to what the data is rather than giving your own opinion. So if someone, you know, if you're at a party and someone's giving your opinion on something versus telling you about data, what the data is showing, you need to make that distinction. And I think that's one of the hardest parts about being, you know, a do-it-yourself investor is you're never going to have a good story at the party. You have to accept you're never going to be the guy that was a Bitcoin millionaire. You didn't, you missed the weed stock uh, bomb bubble or whatever that was. You never beat the market. You didn't buy Apple low and sell high. You just have to accept that. And even for me, it's hard to accept that. You're from an egocentric point of view. You have to realize you're never going to be that guy at the party. You need to tune that off right away. Listen, I, this is like a problem for me at, at home because my my wife and I can never have a discussion because as soon as it gets to opinion, which most conversations do, I'm like, hold on, hold on. Neither of us have any idea what we're talking about. Like, we need to go find some literature on this. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> window into the world of Ben. <laughs> You're as a regular listener, you know what my last question usually is. So I'm super curious as someone who is clearly on a mission you're very well educated and and you you're up to big things in your life how do you define success professionally personally whichever way you want to look at that question yeah so for me when, when you guys graciously accepted me to come on I, I was hoping you'd ask this question because you know you pretty much ask all your guests this question and to be honest from my perspective working in a hospital every day i realized that success is really just having good health it's amazing that you know, we're all so focused on these little minute problems, MERs of 0.3 versus 0.22. How can we at, optimize asset location and things like that as do-it-yourself investors? But at the end of the day, all you can hope for is good health for you and your loved ones. As Robert Downey Jr. said while playing Iron Man, all the money in the world never bought a second of time. Good answer. It's a very good answer. And I think I'd be remiss if I didn't say, you know, as a listener, the first listener on the show, I wanted to thank both of you from all the listeners that haven't been able to thank you. I think it's really amazing what you guys do as an educational product. And you guys are doing this out of the kindness of your heart and for free. And we definitely look forward to it each week. Careful. We might start charging people. <laughs> I think we're already, we've already said we'll never do that. <laughs> oh, well, whoops. <laughs> All right. Well, Wendell, we, we, I appreciate you getting in touch. L like I said at the beginning of the show, uh, you sent me a message on Twitter with a pitch for an episode idea, uh, and it was all about evidence and different levels of evidence and, and drawing analogs between the medical community and the investing community, which I thought was fascinating. And I do think it was a great discussion. So thanks a lot for getting in touch and thanks for coming on. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, Wendell. Really great meeting you and interviewing you and, and sharing your thoughts with everyone. And everyone, thanks for listening. 